And it is a great pleasure to welcome our second speaker for today, Professor Rick Waugh from the University of Rochester. Um, and I have to say, it is, it is a great honor to have, say, one of, one of my grad school professors being willing to do a talk for this series. Um, I did my dissertation research right down the hall from uh, Rick's lab. I used your microwave to reheat my coffee. I don't know if you knew that, but if you didn't, That's sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so it's a great, great pleasure to have uh, Rick joining us uh, to give one of the talks this morning. And he'll be telling us about recent research on the role of cell surface mechanics in leukocyte adhesion. So Professor Waugh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to figure out how to change slides here. There. Um, so what you, um, the, the clinical context for our work is the inflammatory response, which is your first line of defense uh, against infection and injury. And what you're seeing on the screen is um, a, a post-capillary venule in a mouse cremaster muscle. And the light-colored blobs that you see are leukocytes that... Um, have uh, um, been activated and are now engaging with the endothelial um, with the endothelial cells along the wall of the vessel. And you can see that um, cells are rolling along the surface. Some cells are adhered to the surface. Uh, some cells have actually crawled into the uh, surrounding tissue um, where they could deal with a pathogen or an injury. You can also notice that this all thing is happening in the context of a very complex mechanical environment. And so to really understand this process at a fundamental level, you need to understand how the mechanical properties of the cell and the mechanical properties of the interface might affect these adhesive interactions. And that's the focus of today's talk. Um, on the left is an, a naive T cell being aspirated into a micropipette. And this is the method we use to sort of characterize the mechanical behavior of these cells. And what you can see is that these cells, uh, and on the right is an activated T cell. What you can see is once these cells enter the pipette, they continue to flow into the pipette uh, under a constant pressure. So this is a characteristic of a fluid. And so the prevailing uh, description of leukocytes um, is um, is that of a highly viscous liquid droplet. And just like analogous to the surface tension on a water droplet, um, leukocytes have what's called a cortical tension, <clears throat> which is a contractile uh, force at the periphery of the cell that is actually responsible for the spherical shape of these cells when um, they're at rest. And we can measure this tension um, with a simple mechanical experiment. That is, we simply identify the pressure at which the cell neither withdraws from the pipette or moves further into the pipette. We call that the critical pressure. And we can calculate T cortical from this relationship, which comes from the law of Laplace. So one of the things we were interested in is how does this cortical tension differ between different types of leukocytes? And um, what happens when a leukocyte changes uh, its state by, by becoming activated, for example. So here's a list of some, some recent data we've obtained from T cells. Um, the and we looked at two different T cell populations. The, the, the unfractionated cells are all of the T cells from the peripheral blood that were isolated. And then the CD8 positive cells are a subset of those cells. And what you can see is that the cortical tension is fairly consistent and it's not affected by activation when you look at the total population. But if you look at this subpopulation and they become activated, the cortical tension goes up uh, substantially. Um, so cells do change their properties, their mechanical properties in response to um, external stimulus. Note that T cells are significant, have a significantly higher cortical tension than neutrophils, which means they're gonna be a little bit harder to form. They're gonna do more to retain their spherical geometry uh, when subjected to forces. The numbers we obtained for T cells are very similar to what was published for a macrophage cell line um, by another group um, led by Folkmar Heinrich. So um, the question, next question is, well, how do these mechanical properties affect the adhesive process? And so we developed uh, the system uh, with two pressure reservoirs. Um, that um, applied a suction pressure to a pipette that held a bead on which we layered endothelial cell ligands. Uh, 
And another reservoir that we used to apply pressure to a neutrophil inside a larger pipette, and which was sort of like a piston. And by controlling the pressure, we could control the force with which that cell contacted the bead. So we can then do um, open a valve, apply suction, re reverse the um, pressure, pull the cell away, and look for adhesive events between the cell and the con and the and the substrate. We can do that. We can control the contact time. We can control the force. So um, using this system, <clears throat> um, we wanted to look at the, uh, the kinetics of bond formation in that interface. So the probability of adhesion, which is what we measure, is related to the expected number of bonds in the interface um, by this relationship. And um, those expected number of bonds, if you use a simple kinetic model, uh, should depend on the following variables. It should depend on the area of contact, which is equivalent to your reaction volume, the concentration of the two ligands on the surface, uh, some apparent association constant, a reverse rate constant, and T, the duration of contact. So we can measure T, and we can control rho, R rho, L, K, A is what it is. But now we can look at what happens to this system uh, in terms of how the expected number of bonds is related um, to the duration of contact, for example. Um, so the experiment looked like this. Uh, you can see in this case, we have a very, relatively low pressure for a total impingement force of 70 pica newtons. We doubled that to 140, increased it to 210, and then to 280. And the most obvious change that you can see in these images is that the area of contact between the cell and the substrate is increasing as we increase the mechanical force uh, of impingement. So if we go back to the um, uh, expected kinetic of the system, basically what we're seeing is that you should expect the number of bonds to increase in proportional to that contact area. And when we looked at the results of the experiments and calculated the expected number, at larger forces, we got exactly the behavior we were expecting. These, this line actually extrapolates to very close to the origin. Lower forces, we saw something different. And initially we sort of hand waved and said, oh, it must be measurement error. But as we started to think about the process a little more carefully, we realized that this is a physical result that reflects something important about how the cell interacts with the substrate. And that, um, that important piece uh, is related to the surface topography uh, of the cells. On the left is a neutrophil. Uh, and you can see that the surface is covered with what are called microvilli, um, which extend out from the body of the cell. Same is true of T cells, similar kind of surface geometry. Um, this is obtained from the internet. This was one that we captured ourselves. Um, so what about this surface structure? So what it means is that the macroscopic area, which you can measure in the microscope, is not the same as the area of close contact where bonds can actually form. But that area of close contact is actually um, occurs only at the tips of these microvilli. So the question is, under applied force, what happens to these microvilli? And how does the ratio of the area of close contact change to the macroscopic area, which you can measure? And what we realized was that the microvilli uh, will compress uh, with increasing contact stress. So we developed a model of this. Um, using the liquid drop model to develop a realistic uh, contour of the cell body. Um, we got this number of 35 piconewtons from the literature um, from a um, work that was done by Jin Yu Xiao at, the, at Washington University. We measure the microvillus density from our micrographs and uh, we use a distribu distribution of different microvillus lengths. And this turns out to be important uh, for understanding the um, predictions I'll show you in the next section of the talk. But this is the distribution of microvillus heights, and you'll note that they you know, typically range from about 150 to, say, 250 um, nanometers uh, above the surface of the cell. So that's an important dimension to keep in mind. So this is um, the results of the analysis. So each one of these colors represents a different surface contour at a different force level. And the space between the contour and the substrate is occupied by the microvillus or the microvilli. So at very low forces, say one and a half piconewtons, the surface contour doesn't change very much at all. 
And this space basically is supported by the microvilli. As you increase up to about 70 piconewtons, the primary things that happen, primary thing that happens is that the microvilli are compressed up to, uh, up to a point. Beyond that, uh, the cell itself is not stiff enough to compress the microvilli further. So at larger forces, what you see is a, a propagation of the contact area at constant separation. So a constant state for uh, the microvilli themselves. So microvilli compress at low forces, micro then the microvilli are fully compressed, the surface topography in contact with the surface stays the same as the area increases at higher forces. And that's exactly um, what we observe when we were looking at the effects of impingement force on, um, on bond formation. Sorry, my um, mouse is a little sensitive. Um, this is at psycho, uh, 70 piconewtons, and the reason that the number is below what you might expect from a linear dependence on area is that the, the um, microstructure, the surface topography of the cell is still changing at this point. So the area of close contact is smaller um, percentage of the macroscopic area than it is uh, at this level of force. So that was a nice little um, um, insight into how uh, mechanical impingement force can change the way uh, cells adhere to substrates. And I, I've already talked about these, so I won't bore you by reading them all again. Um, so the next piece of the talk I want to talk about is what happens when uh, the molecules on the surface of the cell are not uniformly distributed. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different molecules that are involved in either neutrophil signaling or neutrophil adhesion. And first, we're going to look at two different adhesion molecules, uh, one of them called L-selectin, and the other one uh, is a beta-2 integrin. We'll actually look at two types of those. The L-selectin, it was known from electron micrographic studies, tends to be sequestered at microvillus tips whereas the beta-2 integrins tend to be excluded from the tips and were found more in the valleys between uh, the microvilli. So the question is, how does this non-uniform distribution interact with the surface topography to affect the ability of these molecules to adhere with the substrate or interact with the substrate? Well, we wanted to do this in a live cell so that we could monitor changes in uh, characteristics and behavior. And the technique that we employed to get at this is called total internal reflectance fluorescence microscopy or turf microscopy. Um, if you illuminate the cell with standard whoops, with standard epifluorescence, um, you illuminate the entire body of the cell. And if you then focus at the interface, you can get an estimate of all of the fluorophores that are in this region. Um, um, the fluorescent signal that you get back will be proportion to the total number of fluorophores. In total internal reflectance, the cell is illuminated at, um, at a low angle, below the critical angle, so that um, what happens is the photons are largely reflected at the interface, but they set up an evanescent wave on the other side of the interface that falls off exponentially with a characteristic length of about 100 nanometers which turns out to be just right for trying to see where things are on microvilli, which are on the order of 200 nanometers in height. So what we did was to then to illuminate uh, the surface and then inter, um, um, convolve the uh, strength of the evanescent wave with the location of the fluorophores to predict how the um, turf signal would change uh, with, um, with compression. So we're looking at now the turf signal versus the epi to give you an idea of what percentage of the molecules are actually at the surface. So this is a complicated slide. Well, let me just, it's not as complicated as it looks. So looking at four different donors so that I can show you that there are differences from one person to another. We're actually looking at um, four molecules, MAC1, which is another beta-2 integrin, LFA1, which I can't see because it's behind the screen here, L-selectin, which we talked about as a, as a capture molecule, and PSGL1, which is, um, which is a ligand for L-selectin. So the Xs are PSGL1, the gray squares are MAC1, the dots are LFA1, and the stars are L-selectin. So right away, you can see that L-selectin, which tends to be at the tips of microvilli, 
has the highest turf to epi ratio, as you would expect. What was interesting was that the beta-2 integrins also, as you would expect, would have a lower, um, lower intensity uh, um, reflecting their position farther from the surface uh, in the valleys between the microvilli. Um, the interesting result was for PSG01, which it, in the literature at the time was thought to be co-located with L-selectin. It turns out not to be, although you might think that from this particular donor, but in other donors, it's pretty clear that PSG01 distributes itself where MAC1 is, um, which is kind of an interesting result that um, biologists might think about. Um, the last thing I wanted to say here is, you know, you might ask if L-selectins at the tips of the microvilli, why does the signal continue to increase uh, as you apply greater force and push the cell into a closer contact area? Because this is the intensity per unit area, right? So um, the answer is that this is actually can only result if you have a distribution of different microvilli lengths, which is why we, um, why we use those distributions. So initially, the longest microvilli are coming in contact, that's the signal down here, then as you, as you compress the, the longest microvilli, the shorter ones uh, start to approach the surface and the, and the signal continues to increase. So um, using the modeling that we did to interpret these experiments, we were able to estimate what percentage of the molecules who were say in the top half of microvillus compared to the molecules in the bottom half. And, our calculations suggested that about 85% of the L-selectin is, is near the tip compared to PSG01 and MAC1, where about three quarters of the fluorophores are away from uh, the tip. And LFA1, which is the most sequestered, uh, has about 90% of, uh, of the molecules uh, in the lower half of, of the microvillus. So, um, one question is, does this have any physiological relevance? And so I want to turn to some more recent results that we've obtained uh, on T cells and the effects of um, uh, LFA1 distribution uh, after cell activation. Um, what you can see here are data, again, from three donors. And there is some variability from donor to donor. But the typical result is that you get a lower signal for LFA1. This is the CD11A is another name for LFA1. I apologize for uh, if that's confusing. Um, and we're looking at two different cases here, one where we've specifically labeled that molecule, and the other where we've applied a label that labels the whole cell surface. So this reflects uh, the topography of the cell surface. Uh, and this reflects the relative location of the LFA1. You can see that in every donor in the unactivated cells, in the naive cells, L-selectin is, is sequestered farther from the surface than uh, the average surface location, consistent with the idea that they're not at the tips of the microvilli. When you activate the cell, two things happen. One is the topography changes so that you get much more uh, uh, membrane closer to the surface. And the other is that the difference between these two disappears so that now LFA1 is more uniformly distributed uh, over the cell surface. So the cell in active after activation has done two things. One, it's changed its topography so that it can have more uh, surface area in contact with substrate. And it's also changed the distribution of these LFA1 molecules so that they can engage with the surface more easily. So the last topic I want to take up in the last five minutes here um, is to um, look at what happens when cells spread onto a surface. Cells activated um, uh, will actually change their geometry and, and in some cases even phagocytize um, their target surfaces. So we set up a, a flat glass surface that's coated with a molecule called IL-8. This is a chemoattractant. And when the receptors on the cell surface interact with IL-8, the cell can um, um, change its geometry and spread onto the surface. Um, so before spreading, this is the picture of the neutrophil uh, in its resting state. And after, as it's spreading, it spreads as almost circular lamellipodia out onto the surface, which you can't tell from here, but the surface under this lamellipodium is very smooth. It tends to come into relatively close contact. Um, to the cell substrate. So here's the resting cell. As you start to spread, a few molecules come in close contact. And as the cell spreads, more and more molecules uh, come into close contact with the substrate. 
This is what it looks like um, under the microscope. This is a bright field image. This is a, a neutrophil that's above the surface, just starting to contact the surface. And then as it begins to spread, you can see the spreading of the lamella podium. And then this is the body of the cell that's above the surface and out of focus. In apifluorescence, you can already pick up a fair amount of fluorescence signal as the cell approaches the surface. And then as it spreads, you can see that there's an increase in brightness as the surface smooths and comes into closer contact with the substrate. In turf, you see much less fluorescent signal initially because the cells are relatively, or the molecules are relatively far from the surface. Uh, but then as the cell spreads, you see a very large increase in fluorescence intensity, reflecting a, a very large increase in the number of molecules at the interface. Uh, let me try to get to the next cell. Here we go. So um, we, we modeled this process, and um, I'm not going to take you through all the details in the interest of time, but we approximated a microvilla shape. We started with a realistic distribution of different microvilla heights. We used a uniform label to account for changes in the topography of the surface as the cell spread. Uh, and then for the individual cells, we adjusted the fluorescence prediction by adjusting the lateral distribution or the distribution relative to the microvillus tips um, in the initial state. And then we used uh, a model distribution to determine the change in molecules within, within the range of bonding, the model distribution that we get from here. So this is what the surface shape looked like. The blue color suggests uh, in, that there are few molecules of this type at the surface, whereas the red shows the higher concentration of molecules away from the substrate. Um, this is the distribution of different microvillus lengths that we used. We also had to develop a model for what happens as the microvillus collapses. So we kept the area constant. So this is the edge of this blue microvillus. And then as it gets shorter, the edge progresses outward. Um, and then um, as, as it gets to um, nearly flat, you know, it's basically the whole area is now in this disk. And so we model the height as a function of the disk diameter, which we used as a surrogate for time. Um, and then uh, we needed, so when we measure the uniform label, we're determining these parameters. And then um, uh, we can use a, a, a non-uniform distribution to predict the fluorescence for the individual molecules. So the purple data are uh, what you see for the uniform label. And so this increase in fluorescence as the cell spreads is a result of the change in the surface topography and the geometry of the topography. These results are for, four, are for three different molecules, LFA, our old friend LFA1, and two molecules that are receptors for our stimulating molecule, IL, IL8. And you can see that we fit these curves by altering the distribution of molecules at the tip relative to molecules at the base. And then we can use that information to make predictions about how much uh, of an increase there is in molecules that are available for bonding. Mm -hmm. And that's shown here. So for LFA1, um, in the resting state, only 0.1% of the molecules are within 70 nanometers of the surface, which is roughly the range of interaction for these large adhesion molecules. 99.9% um, are not available for bonding. After cell spreading, when the su surface is flat, basically 100% of the molecules are available for bonding. So that's a three order of magnitude increase uh, in the availability of molecules for bonding. So this could have uh, significant effects on um, cell interactions with substrate. So that's an important, um, an important feature of the whole adhesion process. So this is um, the conclusion I just mentioned to you, and that's sort of the end of the talk. And I just want to thank my um, collaborators. Chris Spillman was a student who did the original neutrophil impingement experiments with help from a lab tech, Rick Bosserman, and a research professor, uh, Elena Lamakina. Um, the modeling was done uh, largely with the help of Olivier uh, Urian, who was in the biostatistics department at the U of R. Um, and his wife, Sandrine Hockday, who was a postdoc in my lab. So that was a nice connection to make. Um, the cell spreading and modeling was done by Graham Marsh, a uh, grad student who finished a few years ago, and Elena. Um, 
And the most recent work on T cells is done in collaboration with my collaborator, Min Su Kim, who's in microbiology and immunology, his student, Andrea Amitrano and Elena. So with that, I want to uh, thank you, and uh, I'm happy to add questions. This is where uh, I work. <laughs> it's the University of Rochester in the foreground. You can see the Genesee River. Uh, this is the university in the background, and the river flows into Lake Ontario, which you can barely see on the horizon. So that's it. I'll stop sharing and uh, take questions. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Let's let's thank the speaker uh, very much, and thank you for that last slide, which makes me homesick for Rochester. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, questions. It looks like there are a few in the chat. Um, and so I think the first one is coming from James Graham. Uh, feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask yourself. Um, yeah, my question is what effect, if any, does the neutrophil spreading have on the cortical tension? And could you comment on how that's perhaps related to the activation that you were talking about in the first part of your talk? Right, so um, once a cell starts crawling, the mechanical properties change dramatically. Um, the lamellipodium, uh, from what I understand from other investigators, gets extremely rigid. So this is a polymerized actin uh, um, lamellipodium that is, is really quite rigid compared to the rest of the cell and the cell um, as it sits uh, passively. So most of the properties I was talking about or what the cell would behave like as it interacts, first starts to interact with the substrate. Um, so um, then once it's on there, the mechanical properties change a lot. And I can't remember, I think someone has made some measurements of the cortical tension at the back of the cell, but I don't actually remember what their results were. Um, it's probably, in, it is in the literature somewhere though. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so there's another question from Azim, Azim Khan. Uh, feel free to unmute if you'd like. Um, oh, okay, I, and I think um, I'd rather have, have me read it. Um, so the question, actually this kind of over, overlaps with the question that I, I was thinking as well. Um, what happens with the increase in the population of cells on the plate? Uh, will it cause an increase in the number of contacts may, um, made by the cell with the plate or with its neighboring cells? Um, so we, these are single cell experiments. So the way we do these experiments is we'll actually grab a cell from a different region of the slide outside where it's outside where the molecules are, and then bring it over to the area where the um, chemokine is immobilized on the surface and drop the cell onto the surface. So we can actually time the time it takes for the cell to begin uh, to begin spreading. We estimate that it only takes a few molecules of um, a few of the IL-8 receptors to be engaged before the cell will react and start to spread. So it's really quite a multiplication of signal once the cell starts to interact with the substrate. So um, the way we got around the cells sitting on the glass before we're ready is to have two regions on in the chamber, one which has coating and one which doesn't, and then we pull cells from where the coating isn't and drop them onto the coating. Okay. Um, let's see, do we have other? Um, Is that clear enough? Well, I'm... Yeah. Um, I seem feel free to put in the chat if if that answered um, the question. And I think we are at the top of the hour, so I think let's officially. Thank both speakers very, very much for wonderful talks. Um, and I will now stop the recording and we can go to a more informal discussion for maybe 15, 20 minutes if the speakers have time to stay. Um, so let me officially stop recording here.